Again, in the Philippians, the third chapter, I'm only going to read this verse 13 and 14. Brethren, brethren, says the apostle, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press the mark to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, did you know that he wrote this two years before he died? He just had two years to go. And then at the end of the two years, or between the writing of this and his testimony in Second Timothy, Something had happened evidently because the man of God said that uh, here that he was he, he know, knew who he believed and that he had fought a good fight and that he had kept the faith and that he was now ready to be offered. Now that something happened in those two years to the man of God. Now, you have been listening to me over these last weeks, and again, we ask, what is the pastor advocating? What is this that he preaches? Well, I'm concerned that it be nothing else but Christ, because anything anybody offers you that is not just more of Christ is false. I'm concerned that in doctrinal foundation it be the Scripture. And in its whole spiritual mood, it be apostolic. And that it be in harmony with the best in the historic church, the best in devotion literature, the best in hymnody, and the best in biography. And yet, why does this preaching sound different? Why does it sound strange when compared with uh, much uh, so-called and true gospel preaching. Well, I want to tell you this before I enter in really to the message for the night. But I want to tell you that about a generation ago, textualism captured the gospel church. By the gospel church, I mean the uh, fundamentalist church, the, the gospel church, those who believe in Christ the Savior and accept him as such and the scribes and the lawyers took over and set up a hierarchy in schools and Bible conferences and churches, and they all went over to it. And the rule became a rigid adherence to words. Now it so happens that I believe and have never believed anything else in my entire life, but in the plenary, that means full verbal inspiration of the scriptures as originally given. You'll be honest with me, and if you have reason to quote me, quote this, that I believe and have always believed as a responsible Christian teacher and believer in the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures as originally given. But uh, the problem was, and still is, that the, the uh, by school I don't mean any particular school, I mean a school of thought, uh, has the verbal inspiration, the doctrine of verbal inspiration, uh, rigor mortis set into it. And uh, with the result, that uh, we were, uh, we were, the religious imagination was stultified, the religious yearning was choked down, the religious aspiration flapped down, and the longing of spiring wings of the children of God were clipped like a hen in a hen coop. And uh, we were told to shut up and like what we had, that this was it. Brethren, do you know what happened to this? 
The result of this thing, with the language of the New Testament persisting, and the spirit of the New Testament grieved, do you know what happened? Well, I'll tell you. There, there, there came about a revolt. A revolt against the scribes in two directions. The masses of evangelicals revolted without knowing they were revolting. They didn't know it. It was the, it was the gasping of a fish in a bowl where there's no oxygen. The masses revolted into religious entertainment until the gospel churches are now camping on the doorstep of the theater. And then, over against that, and on the opposite side, some of the more intelligent fundamentalists and evangelicals revolted into evangelical rationalism, which is already busy making its peace with liberalism. And the result is that we just don't hear what, what the this that I am speaking about. It sounds strange to hear anyone preaching as I preach because on one side we have the masses saying, I've accepted Jesus, do. let's go and have fun. And on the other side, serious, reverent men thinking their way perilously near to the borders of liberalism. And the New Testament message Objectives and methods have been allowed to lie dormant. And in the name of the Lordship of Jesus, which is Lordship in name only, we have introduced our own message, our own objectives, and then have thought out our own methods for achieving those objectives, which are in many cases not scriptural at all. Now, my brethren, I want to ask you, is it heresy to yearn and pray and long after God? Is it heresy? It, does it constitute uh, a, a, a radical mind to yearn and pray and fight? Do you remember what I read the first night? The great prayer in the cloud of unknowing. God, I beseech thee, soul, for to cleanse the intent of mine heart with the unspeakable gift of thy grace, that I may perfectly love thee and worthily praise thee. To long perfectly to love God and worthily to praise him. And to mean more than words when you say it. Mean as it costs you everything. Is that heresy? Should they put a man in jail for it? Should he be ostracized for it? In the light of our hymnody, in the light of our devotion with books back to Paul, in the light of the biography of the saints? No, I think not. No, I want to read to you. Uh, just a brief little thing here, from an the uh, from a book called the Philokalia. He starts out, he wants to help us Christians forward to know God. To do what uh, the cloud calls, be one with God, united with God. Now I want you, Bible Christians, to ask yourself the question, could I, could I go along with this? Now this Nesephorus was a Greek Christian. That is, he was over, over on the, the Greek side. He wasn't a, a Protestant, and he wasn't a Roman Catholic, and he wasn't a Martoma, and he wasn't a Coptic nor a Nestor. He belonged to over on the Greek side, but he was the saint. And he wrote a little book to help people to go on with God, and he said, You who desire to capture the wondrous divine illumination of our Savior Jesus Christ. Do you believe in this? And he seeks to feel the divine fire in your heart. And here was a scholar and a saint, and he wrote it into a book in the, I think, 16th century, which is a classic, and is recognized as such, and he dared to use the word 
who seek to feel the divine fire in your heart and strive to sense and experience the feeling of reconciliation with God, who in order to unearth the treasure buried in the field of your heart and to gain possession of it, have renounced everything worldly, who desire the candles of your soul to burn brightly, even now, not in the future. We have become so dispensationalistic minded that we push everything into the future, everything into the future. But this man says, you who desire the candles of your soul to burn brightly, even now. And Peter said, in this present world, and who for this purpose have renounced all this world, to wish by conscious experience, conscious experience, you think he was a modern psychologist, to know and to receive the kingdom of heaven existing within you. He said what I am teaching all the time, that Christ dwells in the heart of every believer. Know ye not that Christ is in you, except he be reprobate. And if a man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of you. And the riches of the mind lie potentially there. But we have been forbidden to believe it, or forbidden to say so. And we have been choked down, and the oxygen cut off, and our wings clipped, and our longing killed. And uh, that's why what I say sounds different and strange, and people say, what is this new doctrine? It's known as doctrine of Saul. Now, my brother, I want to talk a little bit tonight about the cloud of concealment. Now, Christ has made full atonement for us. Let's start there. Christ has made full atonement. Christ has for sin atonement made what a wonderful Savior. Would you like to hear it said for you by somebody else that could say it better than the theologian? Little Lady Julian, here's what she said. The precious amends for satisfaction our Lord hath made for man's sin turning all our blame into endless honor. Could it be said sweeter than that? The precious amends our Lord hath made for man's sin, turning all our blame into endless honor. Paul said it a little differently. He said, where grace abounded, sin does what? Or where sin abounded, grace does much more bound, turning all our blame in the endless honor. Now, God's face is turned toward us. I want you to think like that tonight. Don't let the devil cheat. Don't let doubt the faith. Don't let anything I say or anybody has ever said cheat you from this glorious knowledge that the face of God is turned toward you. And as a Christian, the smiling face of God is turned toward you. Why then do we not enjoy, now to use these words again, why then do we as Christians not capture the wondrous divine illumination of the Savior Jesus Christ? Why do we not feel the divine fire in our heart? Why do we not strive to sense and experience, or why do we not sense and experience the feeling of reconciliation with God as well as the knowledge of it? And uh, why do we not gain possession of it? Oh, I know they dismiss it by saying it's your, your position and your possession. But that can get so cold as dry ice. Why is it that the candles of our soul do not burn more brightly even now? Why is it that we do not have the conscious experience and know and receive the kingdom existing within us? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there is between us and the smiling face of God a cloud of concealment. Now, my friends, there is never such a thing as a day when the sun doesn't shine. In some of the cities, they, they, I think it's Atlanta, Georgia, isn't it? maybe I'm wrong, but one of the southern cities offers, a newspaper offers, so that they will, they will give all of that run, that day's run to the newspaper, free of charge if the sun doesn't shine somewhere. Is it, is it Atlanta? St. Petersburg? Well, now let me tell you something. 
that the sun shines every day, and there never has been a day from the hour God said, let the sun rule the day, that the sun hasn't shone. But there are dark days and misty days and cloudy days, and days that get so dark you have to light the light, and days that get so dark that in the country the chickens go to roost, I think. Now, there are dark days, and yet the sun is shining just as brightly as on the brightest, clearest day in June. Why, then, does it not shine on the earth? Because there is between the sun and the earth a cloud of concealment. The sun is all right. The sun is up there grinning broadly, and just as bright and just as hot and just as, as radiant as ever. But he doesn't get through to the earth because there is a clouded concealment. Now, what is this cloud, my brother? You know what it is uh, from the standpoint of the weather. But uh, what is it as applied to Christmas? Well, why? What's the matter? Well, it's the cloud that's concealed. The cloud that we allow to be over us as Christians. And what is this cloud? Atonement has been made. There is nothing to do, for it's all been done. Not a drop of blood needs to be shed. Not a spear needs to enter a holy heart. Not a tear, nor a groan, nor a drop of sweat. Not a moment in agony. Death has no more dominion over him. It is done. It is finished. It is forever done. And the face of God shines down upon us. And even upon Christians, there's that cloud, or above Christians, there's that cloud of concealment betwixt thee and thy God, as the brother says. Now, what is that cloud? Well, it's a cloud, it may be one thing, it may be many things. There is the cloud of pride, for instance. You are your father's child, and heaven is your home. And yet for a lifetime, you may go without the wondrous divine illumination of the Savior Jesus Christ, without feeling the divine fire in your heart, or sensing or experience the feeling of reconciliation with God, and without the candles of your soul burning brighter, because you allow a cloud of pride to be over your head. And the devil says, well, God hates you. God turned his back. The devil lies. The back of God has never been turned to a child of God nor to a repentant sinner since the hour Jesus groaned and died and said it's finished. The face of God is turned our way. But uh, we allow this cloud of pride and the cloud of stubbornness. There are some people that are just plain stubborn. They will not bend, they will not yield, neither to man or God, or to anybody, except the law and death, they will not. And so they clouded stubbornness. God complained about Israel. He said, your neck is brass, and your forehead is hard. And he couldn't get them to yield. And then there is the cloud of self-will. Now, self-will is a very religious thing, and it may be come religious and uh, get, uh, get converted and enter right with you into the church when you join, and with you with the chamber when you pray. Yet it's self-will, and self-will, you'll note, is good-natured only when it's getting its own way, and it's brought to you and ill-tempered when it is crossed. Now, you think about that. Is your surrender to God sufficient so that you can be spiritual even when you're caught? And then there is ambition. And you know there's even religious ambition. There are people that are religiously ambitious for something perhaps that isn't in the will of God or that's for self-aggrandizement. And the result is that it's a cloud above them, between them and their God. Now, uh, there's a little proverb, and in the Knox translation, it reads like this. It rather amuses me, because it's so true, and it, 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 it's, it's such a perfect picture of the, of the human heart. He says, tripped by, tripped, T-R-I-P-P-E-D, tripped by his own folly. A man eats his heart out, finding fault even with God. 
And you find Christians like that, tripped by their own folly, they eat their heart out, finding fault even with God, having what God calls a controversy with me. And then, everything I claim for myself. Now, this is the one thing I've been teaching, I suppose it's hard to grasp, that I've got to give up everything. But this pastor that I have here must go on the block, and I must be ready at any moment to give it up and let it ride away on any sermon I preach or any position I take. I dare not stick to it. My job as editor is weekly. My, my position in the religious world, my, my, everything has to be on the block and ready to go. If I own it, it is a cloud over my head, and it becomes, it becomes a cloud of obscurity that nothing will penetrate. And people try to pray through it, but you can't pray through it, nothing can penetrate it. You try to fast through it. There are people that fast for days out of nothing but stubborn. You know that, the history, I won't go into politics, but over the world in the last 25 years, you remember that there were some who fasted and died for political reasons, just sheer, downright stubborn. And uh, there are those who, who try to fast their way through. You can't do it, brother. The cloud of concealment, if it is something that you say is yours and you won't give up, you think you do, but you don't, it'll, it'll, it'll put a veil over. And if there's any sun, it'll not be very bright. It'll, it'll be a cloud. And you can't pray through it. This idea that if you pray long enough, everything will be all right. Why, God got some people up off their knees and told them to quit. Two different instances, the Lord stopped prayer meetings. Did you know that? Said, no, you. There was a man, Saul, and he was praying and praying. God came, put his hand over his mouth and said, Saul, not Saul, Samuel. Said, Samuel, don't pray anymore for Saul. He's true. Said, don't pray for him. Shut him up. And then uh, there was another instance where Joshua was lying face down praying. We'd have written a tract about him. We'd have said, oh, what a thing. But God says, what you lying there on your stomach? I don't honor a man for lying on his belly. Get up off your feet and deal with a quick situation in your crowd, and then I'll bless you and save all that lying around Rome. So remember that uh, this modern idea that if you pray long enough, everything will be okay. Not right, but. The saint of God loves these long seasons of prayer, and uh, God gives an answer to prayer, and prayer is the soul's sincere desire, and the breath of the saint, and all that I believe, and I think practice in some age. But the idea that I can hang on to things, and then pray the cloud away while I'm hanging on to the cloud, no, no, you can't do it. Then that's the trouble. So nothing will get to it, and then there is fear. Fear is always a child of underneath. No matter what you're scared about, whether it's you've got cancer or whether it's your child's likely to have polio or whether you're likely to lose your job or whether the Russia will send a guided missile and destroy Chicago. Remember, always the fear is a child of unbelief. And fear over your head is a cloud of obscurity and hides that smiling face from you. It doesn't, it doesn't turn the faith away, for the blood of the tone that kept keeps his faith forever turned towards his people and towards repentant sinners. And then there is self-love. Self-love. We make a joke out of this, but we never should make a joke out of the train. Because self-love is a cloud of concealment, a cloud of obscurity. And even the Christian who has offered himself to Christ and has, has believed and is converted, that Christian can keep a cloud of concealment over him simply by loving himself. And to fall out of love with yourself is an accident. That is, it is, I don't mean an accident, I mean a hurt. It, it hurts you like falling off of something. And then self-gratulation and self-admiration, these self esteem they're there, and as long as they remain there, and then the odd thing about it is that the scribes have accused these and proved that they should be there and who can't do anything about it. And yet we cry within us, oh, that the candles of my soul might burn brightly even now. 
Oh, that I might know the divine illumination of my Savior Jesus Christ. And we groan with the groan that goes back to Paul in Philippians, that goes back to David in the Psalms, that we might come into a warm, personal, present, lasting fellowship with Jesus Christ that lifts us, and we irradiate our heart, and yet we can't because we admire ourselves, and we're not going to have anybody disturb us. And uh, we congratulate ourselves, or uh, we love ourselves. And then there's money. Money, these days, gets between betwixt thee and thy God, as the brother calls it. Gets betwixt thee and thy God. Some evangelist years ago, in my hearing, pointed out that you can take two dimes and cut out a landscape. You can take two dimes with you to the great smoky mountain and go clear to the top knob of the great smokies, and with two dimes, shut out all the glorious green rolling blue-capped vista of the great smokies. Just put them in front of your eyes and put them close, and that's all it takes. The mountains are still there, smiling in the sun, but you don't see them because there's a dime in front of each eye. It doesn't take much money. We who don't have much money are always taking the snide remarks at the rich man. But brother, you can be rich and only have ten dollars. Because if it is between you and your God, then that cloud, that cloud is concealing God from you. And then there's people, just plain people. The Lord tells us that we shouldn't be afraid of man with his breath and his nostrils. And yet there are people we're Christians who are, have a cloud of fear about them. Constantly a cloud of fear. They want to fit in. They want to fit in here in this society. And uh, the sociologists tell us we must do this, that we must adjust to society. And the schools are busy instead of teaching the history and, uh, and uh, writing and reading and arithmetic and all the rest. They're teaching the children to adjust so as not to be queer and to get along with. Well, uh, if you've got that uh, as your goal, you have a cloud over your heart, my Christian friend. And then there are our friends. And then there's a position we hold, whatever it may be. And then there's the loved ones. And this is the tenderest and perhaps uh, the hardest. But that's all I've got to do. You say, then what do I do with it? If this cloud is over my head as a cloud of concealment, then my father is smiling at me, and I can't see his face. What, what shall I do? Well, the old brother suggests, and I borrow it and suggest to you as a beautiful illustration, he calls it a cloud of forgetting. He said, put this cloud that's above you under your feet as a cloud of forgetting. And Paul said exactly the same thing, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before. You see, the things which were behind Paul were clouds, and they, if they'd been in front of him, they'd have shut out God, but he put them behind him. His defeat, his mistakes, his blunders, his errors, his wrongs, the times he'd fallen on his face and the time the Lord had to rebuke him for his pride, and all this, he put them behind him, and under his feet is a cloud of forgetting. And the old man of God says, put them under you, and did not have them not be thee and thy God. Right so put a cloud of forgetting beneath thee, be thee and all the creatures that ever God made. We've got to get that cloud of forgetting under our feet. <laughs> and of course, that's the job of the Christian. And uh, that's why I'm preaching like this. And some are, are understanding and are going to do something about it. Others are not. Others have come up to the Kadish Barney who want to eat for years and have turned back into the wilderness to wonder why they're sand in their shoes. It's because you would not go on the Kadish Barney. Right so put a cloud of forgetting beneath thee, and all this that had been a cloud of concealment now becomes a cloud of forgetting. 
Now the face of God, I repeat, is smiling still. And not all the cloud I've meant. And not all the clouds the devil can blow up there. And the devil can blow up a storm and put it between you and betwixt you and the face of your God experientially. But uh, remember that uh, God is waiting within the veil. Or to change the figure, he's waiting for you to move up. To move up. I remember getting on a plane at LaGuardia Field in New York some years ago. It was about, I would say, three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, the smiling, relaxed, friendly pilot came out and uh, made a little speech. He knew that old duffers like me would worry about it because it was raining, raining, mi- miserable day, like we get here sometimes. Just, just plain miserable. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, now, uh, we are leaving in a moment. And he said, uh, uh, the situation is this, friend. In 15 minutes, we'll be in the sunlight. In 15 minutes, we'll be in the sunlight. And he says, the weather report shows that it will be clear from here to Chicago. And sure enough, it was. We had a train to that. And so we got into that train almost feeling our way there through the smog and the mist. And in 15 minutes, we put the cloud under our feet. And the bright shining sun above, and as we rose, even the cloud became white beneath it. You who've flown a lot have had the experience of seeing that gray, gray billows of whipped cream that are underneath you, white as whipped egg. And when you were underneath them and looked up, they were a misty, miserable, smoggy thing that shut out the sun. But in 15 minutes, you put them under your feet. And old brother, is it nice to take off in the most and rain and fly all the way 900 miles in the sun. Now, that's what I mean. You're going to have to put this on your feet. You're going to have to get busy about it and do something about this. And more than sit and take in some more, you're going to have to work on yourself. And yet I wonder if you are. I wonder if I'm not contradicting myself. So he says he will thou do but look on him and let him work. I wonder if it isn't better, more accurate to say that if you consent to put the clouds under you, he'll put the clouds under you. What does a man do in an airplane? Now I, being of the nervous type, I help the pilot. I keep balancing the thing as we turn. Now really, I do. But uh, what help am I giving to the pilot, that great big good-natured fellow sitting up there, dreaming, what does he care about a little fellow weighing 159 in the summer and a little less in the winter? Uh, what, what can I do with that great big four-cylinder, four-engine monster? Not at all, but I help him the best I can. But he gets you up there into the sunshine. Look on him and let him alone. That's all. But you've got to be willing that cloud get under your feet. I know a lot of people will never go up. A lot of them. Oh, they have every excuse in the wide world that you not going up. They'd rather stay right down here in the small. And they do. The sun shines brightly, and they think the sun is shining when it is. Now, put it under you, my friend. Put it under you. What is it? Well, I've said money, people, friends, position, loved ones, fear. Uh, all that I claim and call my own, ambition, uh, pride, stubbornness, self-will, and anything else the Holy Ghost may point to in your life, only you know what it is. He is a jealous rival, and he, he is a jealous lover, and he suffers no rival. And whatever rival... There is a cloud between thee and thy God. Now, I don't say that, that, that you're not going to him. I do not say that you are not justified. I say that this we've talked about, this wondrous divine illumination, this ability perfectly to love him and wear the loose of faith, that has been choked out and smitten down and taught out of for generations. This, this, we lack, and we lack it because 
We will not put under our feet the cloud of the truth. We let it rise between us and our God. My brethren, if you will put it under an feet, why, uh, you will find that it hides all the past and all that that bothers you. And that that changes you and worries you and grieves you. It's down there and it's out and it's gone and there's nothing but the clear sky above. But if you have put the cloud under you, then you will, thou do but look on him and let him alone. Simpson wrote this song that nobody ever sings anymore for two or three reasons. One is the tune's bad, and second is nobody experiences it much. It is, I take the hand of love divine, I count each precious promise mine, with this eternal counter sign, I take the undertake. I take thee, blessed God, I give myself to thee, and thou, according to thy word, dost undertake for me. Christ doesn't have to die again. No cross needs ever to be erected again. No value needs to be added to the attainment. The face of God smiles on his people, but the cloud is hiding. Your cloud, my cloud. But you say that true sinners, that true backsliders, but that couldn't be true of good gospel people. It is true of the masses. And because that cloud has been above them, and because they've been taught they can't rise, they've rushed to get a little heartbeat from the theater, rushed to get a little bit of warmth of feeling from Billy Ballantine religious songs and theatrics and all the rest. I don't blame them. They've been cheated and, and, and the, the liars have wronged them as in the days of Jesus. Jesus walked among men in that day with his eyes bright and his beating keen. And he said to them, whatever they tell you, do because they're theologically right, but don't be like them. And they said, we'll kill that man, and they did kill that man. But he rose the third day and sent down the Holy Ghost into the world, and he's mine and yours. Our sweet possession. And don't you let anybody tell you how much you can have of it. Only God can tell you how much you can have of it. Don't you let anybody take you aside. And tell you now not to get excited and not, not to get fanatical. That, uh, you've got all that there is and, uh, brethren, don't you let any that happen to you. Just as sure as God lives. Now hear me. Just as sure as God lives. If we continue in the direction we've been moved. In, 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 in evangelical church, gospel church. That which is now fundamentalism will be liberalism in a short time. We've got to have the Holy Ghost back. And we've got to have the face of God shining down. And the candles of our souls burning bright. And to sense and feel and know the wondrous divine illumination of him who said, I'm the light of the world. Now, does that make a fanatic out of you? Come on, let us little fanatic just go and be joyful in the Lord. If that fanaticism, what a sweet fanatic it makes out of a man. What a happy wonder it is to be a fanatic. No, no, that's not fanaticism. It's fanaticism when you revolt against the scriptures, imagine things, go to weird things, and uh, mis- misinterpret the word of God, but you can't show where one line of the word of God has been misinterpreted by what I say. Not one line. All here, the doctrine is of the faith, the faith of our Father's living still. A lot about it. I take the undertake. Now, if you can if you're willing tonight to put that cloud of self and cloud of self-love and cloud of fear and cloud of stubbornness and cloud of pride and cloud of greed and cloud of ambition under your feet, then there's nothing for you to do. Nothing. For all has been done. Nothing for you to do. You can't find that heaven on a rope ladder. There's nothing for you to do. 
I take the hand of love divine, I cling me straight as strong as mine, with this eternal counter sign I take, he undertakes. I take thee, blessed Lord, I give myself to thee, and thou according to thy word does undertake for me. Ah, do you want him to undertake for it? For me, dear Christians have been walking around under a cloud for a long time. You can't get above you, you just can't. So you tried to pray your way above it, you tried to believe your way above it, but it doesn't work that way. You can't. You've got to put it on your feet. And rise above it. And put all these things betwixt thee and all the creatures God ever made. And look away into the sunlight. And then you relax, but there's nothing you can do. What can a man do? He can't fill himself with a holy ghost. He can't cleanse his own heart. You can't crucify you. You can't. God has to do it. And you do it. You wait to do it. And you wait optimistic and friendly and uh, on your side. Wanting to help you. Willing to do it. Anxious to do it. If you could use the word anxious to touch and go. But we sit back. And we're discouraged. And we're blue. And we've been to so many altars and we've read so many books and we're all confused. Until the sun shines and still the cloud hovers. And still God's poor people won't crowd it under their feet. Into the sunshine in fifteen minutes, said the boy. Into the sunshine in fifteen minutes, says the man who brought you tonight. But they put it all under your feet. Dare to put it under your feet. And look away to the Lord Jesus. Not trying to tell him what to do or how to do it. But look on him and let him work. And over the next hours and days and weeks, you will move upward into a place of spiritual restfulness and power such as you never knew before. And you'll have a marvelous deliverance from bondage, a marvelous freedom. You believe in the system. We believe in the word of God, in its verbal inspiration, the full, clean air of it. We believe in it, and yet out of it there will come a fragrance and a radiance and illumination that you never dreamed of before. Are there those here that can say amen and know what I'm talking about? Amen? No, no.